speaker, Professor Emilio Nuzilis. Emilio Nuzilis is the chair chairman AFOHR Italy. AFOHR is an association forensic odontology human rights. AFOHR counts over 40 members from 20 countries and in the first association promoting best practice in human identification. Professor Emilio Nazilis is a researcher and assistant professor in legal medicine at University of Turin, Italy. He was the head of Human Identification Laboratory Institute of Legal Medicine. He was co-founder of Forensic Orientology for Human Rights Association. He was expert before the International Penal Code and Civil Penal Code of Bari, Italy. He is also a member of Forensic Orientology Sub-Working Group, Interpol DVI Forensic Orientology for Human Rights Association. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. And without wasting much time, let's start with the session. Thank you, sir. Good morning to everyone. First of all, I'm very happy to join this workshop. I will give you a very brief introduction of what is forensic odontology, just two, three slides. And then we will enter in those dental features that can be important in face recognition and also human identification. And you will see yourself from the pictures why they can be so important. First of all, forensic odontology, some of you already know that uh, is a field of, of dentistry and uh, forensic pathology and forensic sciences. And we basically work in three main fields, which is the field of human identification, age estimation and bite mark analysis. Also, depending on the, um, on the nationality of the dentist, we also are involved in malpractice cases related to dentistry, and we can also be involved in uh, uh, dental damage or insurance uh, uh, evaluation, which is something that differs from country to country because it is something related to the national laws. So malpractice and dental damage is something that is country oriented and country related. So the way you assess a dental damage or a malpractice in India is totally different from the way we do in Italy because the legal system is different because we have a, a civil law system, for example, and you have a common law system. But the three main fields of forensic odontology, which is human identification, age estimation, and bite mark analysis, are universal because every country in the world performs human identification with dental means, performs dental age estimation, and performs bite mark analysis in the same way using international protocols. So these three areas are worldwide uh, uh, the same and there isn't a national distinctions. Uh, of course, when we try to understand where we can apply on a live situation this expertise in forensic odontology, you can have, you can read here the list of the various environments and scenarios where you can be involved in applying this expertise. First of all, the human identification aspects is involved in mass disaster victims identification, which is when there is a, an earthquake, a terroristic attack, uh, an accident with the flight, uh, all these kind of national and man-made accidents can unfortunately leave uh, victims and these victims have to be identified because the visual recognition is no more uh, applicable. Also, human identification is involved when there are war and other conflict situations. Imagine, for example, mass graves where you have uh, hundreds of people that are buried or are uh, buried together in a mass grave and you need to identify them. But you also can have a single person, a single human remain, a single collected person who needs to be identified. And this is the field of missing and unidentified human remains. Then we can be involved when we need to assess the age 
of miners that cross borders. For example, in Italy, we have uh, a lot of migrants and uh, coming from the north of Africa, coming from east, and they try to cross European border. And some of them, uh, are, of course, all of them are without any kind of documents, and some of them refer to be minors. This is what we call the unaccompanied minor migrants. And these, these persons, these boys, these girls, needs to be assessed from the point of view of age, and we can use the method that we apply on the development and growth of the roots of the wisdom tooth, which can be used to assess if you are a minor or an adult. Also, we have the field where you find bite mark evidence, human bite mark evidence, and this human bite mark evidence can be found in homicide, in domestic violence, in sexual abuse, in child abuse, in torture, and all these uh, areas, you can have bite mark evidence which can be useful in the investigation because they can give an idea of who is the perpetrator. Also, then forensic odontologists can be called to go on the crime scene to collect dental evidence. And again, we also can be used, uh, can we use our expertise in order to recognize victims of human trafficking. Then we have again the area of malpractice and patients' rights, which is, as I said, something related to the national judicial system. And then we can have uh, um, opportunities like the one we created uh, through our association called Forensic Odontology for Human Rights, which are humanitarian services, pro bono services in the field of forensic odontology, which we call Humanitarian Forensic Odontology Actions. Now, dental identification, which is the reason why uh, Dr. Ranjit included the dental features in this workshop, is because dental identification is one of the most important uh, methods that should be applied when we need to identify a person. You have forensic odontology and we use dental methods because of the characteristics of teeth. I will show you some characteristics which are related to the photo workshop you are attending, but there are so many dental features that are unique and that are useful in order to perform a dental uh, an identification. First of all, because teeth are extremely resistant and are durable. And also dental treatments are resistant and durable. And of course, all these combinations, the presence of a tooth, sound tooth, the presence of a tooth with the tre dental treatment, the absence of a tooth, and all the other crown roots anatomical characteristics all together represents, represent a unique key of a specific person. And this is why dental method is so powerful and so important in human identification. Usually we can do an ID because we have the dental characteristics. As you can see here, you have crowded teeth in the inferior right of the slide. You can see there are um, extra teeth in the mouth. You can see that directly by observing and doing the dental autopsy. But basically, we also perform a comparison of x-rays, x-rays of the mouth, which are the x-rays that we have taken on the human remain during our uh, dental autopsy, that we compare with the x-ray of the people who are reported missing that are compatible with the biological profile. Because let's imagine we have a single person that we need to identify, and this person is skeletonized. So he, she cannot be recognized visually. We perform our dental autopsy, and in the dental autopsy, we observe 
teeth and jaws. We take pictures of teeth and jaws and we also take x-rays. Once we have created a biological profile of that person, which means that we have assessed the age, the sex, the geographical origin and a social status of the person, then we address this uh, biological profile to the police and the police comes back with the list of missing persons who are compatible for the age, the sex and ge the geographical origin. Once we have narrowed the person who are compatible, then we ask relatives, the next of kin and parents and relatives of the missing people to, uh, to, to take and collect uh, x-rays of dental treatments when they went to the dentist. And these x-rays are then compared with the x-ray we have performed on the human remains. This means, this is what we usually say is that we perform a comparison of the antemortem x-rays, which are the x-rays of the persons once alive when he was going to, to have a treatment to a dentist. We take these x-rays and we compare these x-rays with the x-rays we have performed on the human remain on the cadaver. When we do the comparison, we compare not only dental treatments, but we can compare also anatomical features of the roots, as you can see here. The anatomical features of bone, because the trabecula of the bone have also identifying features that can be used to, to get an idea. And of course, also the anatomical features of the internal area of the tooth, which is called the pulp. As you can see here, you can have a comparison and the matching of images of the antemortem X-ray and the postmortem X-rays, plus so many other aspects. Here you can see which is the flow chart that we usually use when we have to perform a human identification process. The human identification process is an investigation where we put together so many different puzzles of the, uh, of the collection of information that is performed by police, by parents, and by forensic sciences experts, which will include the fingerprints, the DNA, and of course the dental, uh, the dental characteristics. The, as you can see at the, at the top of the, of the slide, we can also perform visual recognition. Now visual recognition is a method that police applies when there are specific cases, but visual recognition is something that is extremely critical. It, has, uh, it is very, sometimes it can create uh, mistakes. You can mix identities and it's a very risky method that usually we as experts don't support because when you do an identification, you have to respect technical and scientific protocols, which are the ones you are you can see at the bottom of this slide again the primary identifiers that must be collected and must be used for the human identification include the fingerprints collection analysis and comparison dna collection and comparison and also the forensic odontology method which is the dental features dental x-rays and all dental information that can be collected during the dental autopsy and from the parents and the next of kin. Also, in the scientific identification, we have what is called secondary identifiers, which are other unique identifying characteristics of a person, of a dead person, which can be jewelry, personal belongings on the body like watches, rings, necklace, necklaces and also 
tattoos, scars, all these characteristics, of course, are unique. And, the, and this is what we call secondary identifiers. So the secondary identifiers, for example, a tattoo and, uh, an, and an earring, a necklace or a ring, must be combined with at least one primary identifier in order to achieve a positive identification. So, for example, you can have a matching of fingerprints in combination with uh, a personal identifiers like a tattoo, or you can have a DNA, or you can have a dental feature. But there is a limit with uh, the fingerprints and the DNA and the secondary identifiers because they are not in the position to establish a generic profile of the person. The generic profile of a person is the list of uh, uh, identifying characteristics like, as I said, age, sex, geographical origin and lifestyle status. All these characteristics are fundamental because you need to narrow the person who are missing that could be compared with the person I am doing the dental autopsy. Because otherwise, the risk is that you have hundreds and hundreds of missing people and you cannot perform a comparison with the, the DNA that you have collected from the unidentified person and you cannot compare that DNA with the 2,000 people that are reported missing. Or you cannot compare for the fingerprints that you have collected on the human remain with the two, three thousand people that are missing. So the dental autopsy is the only forensic assessment that allow police to narrow the person who could be compa compared with the information we have collected. And this is extremely important because at the very early stages of a human identification process, you need to narrow the number of people to compare the information because the number of missing reported persons are thousands. So you cannot do a comparison with one single autopsy and a thousand reported profile. Are you following me? Good. If you have any question, please go ahead. Uh, now, I don't know why it doesn't go ahead. Let's see. So, for example, if you have uh, burnt human remains, like in this case, but even if you have uh, well-preserved faces, like this dead person with a denture, or if you collect uh, human remains from the sea, this is what you see. You see that in, in this picture, that teeth are perfectly preserved, and you can observe that this person has a fixed dental prosthetics in metal ceramic. Or you can have uh, traumatized persons, and this is the reason why all these kind of persons cannot be visually recognized. When we go back to you know, 2011, we have the, the exactly, exact example, exactly example of how you cannot perform any visual identification because you have fragmented human remains. And in fragmented human remains, we can perform X-ray, like you have this fragmented, this fragment of the mandible on the top of the slide, which is part of a burnt human remain. We can perform an X-ray, and you can see at the bottom that the X-ray allow us to understand that it is an inferior molar with an endodontic treatment. And this is one of the fundamental aspects that we can use as an identifying feature. Then we have an example, for example, of the tsunami 2004, where you have people that were, uh, that were kept in a hot and humid uh, environment, and they were not uh, they could not be identified visually because of the decomposition of the body. Here is just an example of how dental identification is so important and so powerful in the identification process. 
these are the figures related to the tsunami 2004 and you can see that there is a 20 percent of identification performed by dna 35 percent performed by fingerprints and 45 percent performed by dental but if we compare these figures with the different nationalities and we take as an example german and sweden you can see and the and thailand people you can see that uh, every mass disaster can have a different management because the people from thailand they have recorded their fingerprints so all the victims from thailand most of the victims from thailand were uh, identified using fingerprints comparison while uh, most of the victims from germany and most of the victims from, uh, from sweden were instead identified by dental identification methods now let's go back to the idea of the workshop and why dental features are so important when i started to work on the in this field i have been doing some casework where i was asking to the families of the missing person to give me any portrait picture of the missing person showing teeth because as I will see, as I will show you, the frontal teeth have so many character, individualized, individualizing characteristic that can be used as an, an extra information for the identification. For this reason, in 2016, we decided to create an app, a free app called Selfie Forensic ID app which is an app that collects selfie of your smile. This is what you see when you open the app. You have the opportunity to do a selfie picture of your frontal teeth. You, of course, have to, once you download the app, you have to register with your name, surname, and country. Then you perform a picture of your frontal teeth. And this picture is then, once I approve it, because it arrives in a cloud that I manage, once I verify that uh, that picture is a picture of fraud thief and not something else, uh, because somebody may do a joke and may use this app to perform other kinds of pictures, when I establish and verify that it is a frontal thief, then these pictures are shared in social networks. This is the page on Google Play where you can download the app. And once the picture has been approved by me, because I manage the dashboard of the app, the picture is shared in Twitter and in Instagram. And the reason why, and it's saved and is shared using name, surname, age, city and the date as you can see on the right the picture has the name of the person the age the city and the date now why it is so useful because imagine i am performing i am performing a dental autopsy on an on a unidentified human remain recovered from the sea but uh, because of the of uh, some uh, personal belongings, personal findings, like a watch and a ring, we start to have an idea that this person could be either person A or either person B. So we start to have, for example, two possible uh, candidates that are missing, and uh, these two, one of the two may be the person who I am performing, where I am performing the autopsy. So. I go on the web and I look for the for if there are any picture of person A or person B. Maybe these two people have a, pro, a social network profile, or maybe they have shared some information, some pictures of themselves, and maybe some of these pictures are showing their smile. So I look on the web and I try to see if there are any portrait pictures. Using the app, 
on the web, I will also be able to search and find extra picture of the missing persons showing their frontal teeth. And as you can see here, there are some features that are uh, unique, like the uh, diastema or the fracture of some crowns, which can be useful from the identification. And let's see these dental features one by one. If we go one by one, then one of the major uh, information and features are what, what we call diastema. The diastema is the distance that some teeth have between, between them. Usually is in the, in the middle of the two frontal superior incisors, as you can see here, or as you can see here, but sometimes it can be also in other areas of the frontal teeth. And this diastema, this space between teeth, is extremely individualizing. And one important aspect, I'm not saying that you are performing a positive identification only because there is a matching of diastema. The information you get from the frontal teeth are an auxiliary information. You are not uh, uh, supporting the identification only using dental pictures of the front teeth. But these pictures can help you, again, to narrow the identification process. And also, as you can see in this picture, the diastema is between the teeth that have no dental treatments at all. So the identification process does, using the dental method is not related only to dental treatments, but also to dental identifying features like this one. Then you have the wrong position of teeth, like in this case is what we call third class, that is the mandible is longer than, uh, than the, uh, the mandible is uh, wider than the maxilla and for this reason you have uh, the, the, a, a very specific characteristic of a person. Then you have other wrong position, malposition of teeth like in this case and imagine if this person is doing a, a, a portrait picture showing a smile, she will show definitely these dental characteristics, which are particularly useful to identify this person. Or in this case, where you have canines, inferior canines, which are rotated, and superior lateral incisor, who is malpositioned. And these are, again, uh, identifying features of teeth that have no dental treatments whatsoever. Then we have other characteristics of the front teeth that you can see when somebody is uh, smiling and when you take a picture of that smile, which are the pigmentations, but also what is called technically amelogenesis imperfecta, which is... Uh, a specific alteration of the, of the enamel of some teeth because when you are a child at the age of one, two, three, you have been using a lot of antibiotics and because of this, your permanent teeth will have uh, an altered uh, uh, tissue of the crown, which is enamel, and this enamel has some white spots distributed uh, all around the crown and as you can see these pigments this and uh, this white character particularly white characteristics of the enamel is particularly visible when you do a picture or uh, the amelogenesis imperfecta can be seen in uh, uh, straws like this or even white spot like this one which could be seen when you have a picture of the smile. Then you have also 
other features like what is called dental piercing because uh, you sometimes you have uh, young uh, people who like to have uh, this little uh, diamond which is not a real diamond uh, which is uh, sticked to the tooth for aesthetic reasons or even some piercing inside the mouth like in this case which can be seen of again if you do a picture showing your smile another interesting characteristics it is what is called pink tooth which you probably will not be able to see it clearly in this picture because this is a picture taken from professor Campobasso. it's a it's, it's a typical characteristics of the people who have been uh, killed by droning because there is a uh, the, the blood is um, remains uh, in the inside the pulp and uh, the, it, it changes color because of uh, this because the blood because of the uh, pigment of the blood of the hemoglobina the the the, 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 the color of the tooth goes to 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 pink and that's why it is called uh, uh, pink tooth and it's interesting because uh, these people uh, who have been strangled uh, it's something that is useful because thanks to the color characteristic of tooth you can confirm that uh, the cause of death of that uh, person was suffocation Another characteristic, of course, is the recognition of dental prosthetics, which is something that probably requires to be a dentist, because in this picture, not everyone is a, a capable of seeing that there is a, a tooth, a false tooth here, and a tooth, tooth, and false tooth here. The two lateral incisors, this one and this one, are ceramic and this is the, the the bridge this is the characteristic it's one crown in po in porcelain or ceramic which is uh, sticked and uh, on the adhesion on the adhesion adhesi on the uh, adhesion teeth on the side so you can see this is extremely individualizing characteristics and you can see this if you enlarge a picture and you start to see that the two lateral incisors are certainly prosthetics and are not natural or even characteristic like this bridge and you can see other characteristics of bridge that are extremely individualizing also you may have pictures showing a fracture of teeth that are of course individualizing and also you can have uh, uh, you can find people that are doing orthodontic treatment and of course these uh, these characteristics are very easily uh, seen on the pictures of uh, people showing smile now pictures of people showing smile are the picture you take during Christmas during ceremonies during uh, uh, birthday uh, birthday parties and all the other selfies that we perform nowadays showing our teeth consider that uh, one of the features of our uh, dental treatments and is uh, the use of raising composite that's why when we perform a dental autopsy we must use also uv light on the person on the dead person because as you can see here you have uh, dental uh, characteristics like you can see here in this picture if we don't use uv light on our cadaver we will not be able to see all these uh, composite restorations that have been performed on the frontal teeth of course we in this case we will have to use uv light during the uh, the dental autopsy but uh, also we can do and compare the picture of the frontal teeth with the x-ray of the person because we may have situation like this one this is a, a picture taken of a burnt human remain 
Well, I took uh, this picture and you can see that uh, the teeth are well preserved uh, even if there was fire. But uh, for a dentist, they, for a forensic odontologist that observed this person, you easily understand that there is one tooth which is missing. Because in this case, you have the central incisor, you have the lateral incisor, and you have the first premolar, but the canine here is missing. So if you compare this picture with the X-ray, the X-ray which is here, the post-mortem X-ray taken on the person, you can see that the canine is uh, uh, retained, and the picture of the person who are we trying to identify with the panoramics X-ray show you that uh, the canine is uh, retained and this is the reason why it is not seen uh, here because in this case the canine is somewhere here as you can see and so the picture again allows you to understand that there is a canine missing and the canine missing can be the result of an extraction or can be the result, as in this case, of uh, a tooth which is never erupted. Now, I will go to the conclusion. Any question until now? No question, good. Now, to go to the conclusion, first of all, I would like to share with you this uh, idea that our university started in June, uh, which was uh, translated by my colleague, uh, Dr. Emlata Pandey from, uh, from uh, Mumbai, and I'm sure you can read it yourself. It's a, a, an, a, an informative campaign which is uh, addressed to the family of the missing person because uh, we are saying we are trying to raise awareness on the on the um, on the families that there could be picture sorry there could be picture portrait picture like this one which what's going on which can be used to identify and also selfie picture that you people people families of the missing persons should share because as i showed you there are dental features of the frontal teeth which can be used for human identification one of the aspects which is very important is the use of the dental autopsy again so the dental autopsy will include the pictures of the frontal teeth because the frontal teeth are pictures that can be also uh, published in social media and in newspapers and in magazines and we can circulate these pictures when we are looking for a, an ID of a missing person rather than circulating pictures of skeletonized human remains we can share in magazines and in media just the picture of the frontal teeth also to ask anyone if they recognize those dental features of that specific smile. Do like and comment your reviews. Subscribe Forensic 365 for more videos and updates.